Hi, I'm Michelle Shelfont, psychotherapist, holistic life coach, and human, just like you, learning to navigate life's challenges. With over 25 years experience, I teach people how to get healthy using the adult chair model. The adult chair model is where simple psychology meets grounded spirituality, and it teaches us how to become healthy adults. From anxiety and depression to codependency and relationship issues, you can use the adult chair for just about anything. Each week, I share practical tips, tools, and advice from myself and a wide range of experts on how to get unstuck, how to live authentically, and how to truly love yourself all while sitting in your adult chair. Welcome to the Adult Chair Podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Adult Chair Podcast. I am Michelle Shalfant. Happy to be here with you today on this final Thursday of February in Relationship Month. <laughs> I want to call this Relationship Month, February. We're finishing out the month talking about friendships. I had the wonderful Dr. Marissa G. Franco on the show. We had a great conversation all about how to create and make new friendships as an adult. So I don't care if you are in your 20s, 30s, 50s, 70s. How do you do it? We had a great talk around this because what I realized is for me, I've moved around so many cities and so many houses over all these years. It was a lot easier when I had little kids going to school and I'd walk into preschool. And then when they, when I stopped walking my kids into school, I wasn't around as many parents. And I realized, how do you make friends when you are not walking your kids in and out of school or when they are not in sports. And then of course, as my kids got older, I was like, wait, <laughs> now I don't have anyone to walk anywhere or go see a sporting event. So how in the world do you make friends? And we talked all about this, but again, even for someone that's in their twenties, how do you do it? How do you make friends if you don't have kids? You know, what is that thing that can draw you in and help you to make new friendships? So we had a great talk all around this. She gives all kinds of tips and pointers on this. And I want to remind you, as always, no matter what we're doing in life or who we're trying to become, self-worth is imperative. Self-worth is a journey. And in my opinion, it is a life long journey, something that we are building as we grow up and grow old. And this is why I have created for all of you my self-worth bundle. And what's going on here is we have four meditations all on building self-worth from finding your true self to working with limiting beliefs to embracing your power. And with that, I have written for you journaling prompts. So this bundle can be found at theadultchair.com forward slash worthy. Check it out. I think you're going to love it. It is definitely something that will help you to continue to build your self-worth. Let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Marissa G. Franco. She is an enlightening psychologist international speaker, and New York Times bestselling author. She is known for digesting and communicating science in ways that resonate deeply enough with people to change their lives. She works as a professor at the Uni University of Maryland and authored the New York Times bestselling book, Platonic, How the Science of Attachment Can Help You Make and Keep Friends. It is with great pleasure that I welcome to the show, Dr. Marissa G. Franco. So welcome to the Adult Chair Podcast, Dr. Marissa G. Franco. Thank you so much for having me. What does the G stand for? I'm just curious. Gina. It's my mom's I, name. I love that. Gina. It's a pretty name. Thank you. Um, nice to meet you. And um, this is an important topic. I want to hear. I, I'm looking forward to this show, I have to say. Me too. Mm -hmm. I want to hear about this book that you wrote, Platonic, How the Science of Attachment Can Help You Make and Keep Friends. How the heck were you even in? I want to hear about the, the inspiration for this book. 
Yeah. So I didn't always value friendship so much, but in my younger 20s, I went through some breakups and felt so bad about them that I decided to start this wellness group with my friends where we would meet up to practice wellness, cook, meditate, do yoga. And it was so life-changing for me. But what was most life-changing wasn't the wellness as much as it was meeting with the community that I love, that love me every week. And it caused me to question a lot of my beliefs around romantic love that had made, I think, my grief so much worse, which was romantic love is the only love that makes me lovable. And if I don't have romantic love in my life, I have no love at all. And I looked around and I'm like, this is love. Like, why doesn't this count? I've always had love around me. Like, why don't I recognize this as love? So I got really hungry for a book. I guess I wanted to read a book that framed friendship as sacred as I had come to find it. Mm -hmm. I wanted to see something that leveled this hierarchy that women in particular are, are told about when it comes to love. And so that's why I was really inspired to write platonic. I love that. I love that. So the science of attachment can help you make and keep friends. How? Tell us how. Tell, tell us just a little bit about the book. Yeah. So um, the thesis of the book is how we've connected has shaped who we are. Our personalities are a reflection of our experiences of connection or lack thereof, whether mm -hmm. you are cynical, trusting, warm, vulnerable, closed off, you know, these are all traits predict predicated on what your connection experiences have looked like. But then who you are affects how you connect that whether we connect isn't random or arbitrary, but those people that have had those healthy relationships in the past, they've developed an internal template or set of assumptions based on those relationships that help them to continue to connect in the future. And so basically what I'm telling you is attachment theory, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> yes, you know, people have a certain set of characteristics based off of their early attachment relationships. And if you have had healthy relationships, you're someone who's secure. And so you develop a set of assumptions when it comes to relating to other people that really allows you to continue to build relationships. Mm. Okay, here's my question. Do you feel that, when we are younger, um, the way that we would make a friend is the same as the way that we would make friendships or as social as we are, et cetera, the way that we attach. Is it the same in our 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s? You know, does it change as far as like, yeah. like I'm, I'm, I guess I'm, 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 I'm having a visual right now. I'm like, okay, I'm picturing a little kid on a playground, let's say in preschool or, or kindergarten or something like that. And I'm watching, I'm thinking, okay, I wonder how social they are. How, do, how well do they make friends? So if that little kid that's, let's say six years old or five years old makes friends really well. Do you feel like then that same person that's in their thirties, forties, fifties, sixties would be also someone that would make friends really well, or does it change over mm -hmm. time? Well, it's not deterministic, but there are links like people that have friends in, in younger life are more empathic in later life. They tend to have high self-esteem, be more moral in later life. Um, people that are lonelier during those adolescent years, that's related to being lonely in, in the later years. And mm -hmm. so, you know, there is just like, I think the research on social anxiety finds that if you experience social anxiety as adult, you were likely you know, rejected or bullied somewhere in the adolescent period. Mm -hmm. And so I think there is this way that there is some carryover, but I also want to emphasize, because, you know, I tell people about attachment theory and sometimes it sounds like doom. <laughs> like they're just like, oh, I guess I didn't have these healthy relationships. So there's no hope for me. Um, so I also want to emphasize that it can absolutely change as well. I mean, it's, it's an internal template. So it requires you to, to understand what some of your assumptions are about connection mm -hmm. and to be active about trying something different. But research finds, for example, that even knowing, learning about attachment theory shifts your attachment a bit. So, um, you know, there's this category earn secure, which is people that have become more secure later in life, even if they weren't when they were young. And so mm -hmm. while it can certainly stay the same, if you're intentional about putting the work in, then you can definitely change your attachment style as well. 
I think that's really interesting. So just knowing about attachment and what your style might be um, changes your style, which tells me I'm making up a story. I don't know what's true, but I'm guessing that then just having an awareness of it, then you're aware of maybe when you're in your um, um, anxious attachment or avoidant it or whatever. So, and you're going to strive to become more secure. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. So you understand what your pitfalls pitfalls are. Yeah. If you don't know your attachment style, you're just like the problems in the world. Like if I'm anxious, people are just going to abandon you at the end of the day and relationships are inherently fragile. Like you might just think of it as a generalized truth. If you're avoidant, you can't trust people. Right. Mm -hmm. But once you understand your attachment style, you're like, oh, there are things that I'm doing to create this outcome that I fear. There's this confirmation bias that I have where I recognize the one moment a friend faltered and I'm not acknowledging all the times that they do show up for me because that's my attachment style. That's what I assume. That's what I look for mm -hmm. to be true. Mm -hmm. And so there's this way that you can, you know, have more humility around your initial assumptions. Whereas if you're anxiously attached and you know, anxiously attached people tend to assume people are rejecting them, even when they're not, they tend to mm -hmm. misfire. The amygdala mm -hmm. of their brain lights up more to ambiguous signs of rejection than the other attachment styles. You can say to yourself, all right, they haven't texted me back um, yet. And I know that as an anxiously attached person, typically I assume that it's because they hate me. But in this moment, I'm going to pause and maybe consider that there might be an alternative explanation. Like it's that humility piece. That's super important. Like Ooh, that's good. I think being secure is not about never feeling insecure. It's about having an alternative secure voice too and leaning into or buying into the more secure side of you. I like that a lot. So then um, what would someone say to themselves, again, if they're going out and making new friends as, as an adult um, that would be avoidantly attached, what would be a good self-talk that they could have in their minds? I think just being hopeful and optimistic. So avoidantly attached people are like, kind of people are out to get you when you can't trust mm -hmm. them. Like mm -hmm. there's people out there that are ready to love you. Um, people out there that are interested in getting to know you and are good and decent and kind people. And, um, you know, you, we tend to see a lot of things in avoidantly attached people. For example, if you do something nice for an avoidantly attached person, they're more likely to think that you're doing it for your own personal gain and not to actually receive it as a loving act. Mm -hmm. And so checking yourself in that moment, like, mm, I may think they're just doing this for themselves, but what if they're doing this as an act of love. Can I actually receive that in this moment? Or for example, if you're avoidantly attached uh, with the other attachment styles, when people are vulnerable, they feel closer to the people that are vulnerable. Avoidantly attached people are threatened by emotion. So if someone's vulnerable, they're like, ah, fear of intimacy. Um, this is going to make me feel more vulnerable to being hurt. And so just mm -hmm. even reminding yourself, oh, there's a joy that I can attend to about this vulnerability too. Like, it's like shifting your attention, right? It's like manually overdriving where your attention tends to go based on your attachment style to focus on a more securely attached way of trying to interpret it, interpret things and reminding yourself of that, that more secure sense of reality, which of course requires you to know what is a secure sense of reality. Right, so exactly. that's what I, I try to explore in platonic. So what is it? Give, give us a few ideas. What, what does that look like? So there is this study wherein um, these kids, it was like kids reading about vignettes. And it was like, let's say you're in the cafeteria mm -hmm. and your friend spills, comes up from behind you and spills milk on you. How do you interpret what's going on? And the insecurely attached kids thought, my friend is going out of their way to be mean and to harm me. And they would exact, would report wanting to exact re revenge on their friend. Whereas the securely attached kid was like, my friend's probably clumsy, <laughs> you know, it's okay, friend, you were clumsy and to kind of let it go from there. And so what this study kind of suggests is that people that are secure assume that people love them. <laughs> they assume that people like them. So that's one of my biggest tips when it comes to making friends, assume people like you when it's ambiguous, unless it's, and sometimes it's clear that they don't, <laughs> and it's not about being, um, dense to the fact that sometimes people don't like you, but it's about when it's ambiguous and you don't know for sure, make a more positive, more pro-social assumption that this person likes me. And this is, so this suggestion is based off of research that, um, you know, 
when people are told you're going to go into a group and be liked based on your personality profile, Mm -hmm. that wasn't even true. But what they found was that people then became kinder and friendlier and more open in the group. And so it became the self-fulfilling prophecy. It's called the acceptance prophecy. But we see like at all stages of friendship, what the assumption that people like you can do for you because intimacy is so much a risk. And if you're an insecurely attached person, you're always thinking about the potential negative, which Mm -hmm. stymies your ability to engage in the risk. But if you're securely attached, You know, if I ask for support from my friend, they'll want to show up for me. That allows you to ask for support. Or if I try to address this problem, my friend will be willing to hear me out. Allows you to address problems instead of withdrawing and also address them in a less reactive way because you don't assume that it's about to be antagonistic, right? So just across the entire lifespan of the friendship, like assuming that people like you can really benefit your ability to both make and keep friends. I really like that. So assume that people like us. And then when you do that, it's like your filter changes with how you see the world. So then the world is going to show up quite differently when you can really, really own that, assume that people like us. I'm going to write that down. That's really good. I will say like, I'm the same person, but I used to be much more anxiously attached than I am now. And both my assumption that people were always going to reject me and now my assumption that generally people perceive me positively even though I'm the same person, both felt very true (laughs) because right. When I assume that people were rejecting me, for example, let's say I didn't hear someone didn't text me back for seven hours. Then eventually they texted me back. But did I remember that they texted me back or did I remember the seven hours of turmoil where I was ruminating on whether they're actually going to respond and fearing rejection and fearing, you know, what did I say that might've pushed them away? Right? Like that was my mental memory, even though the actual fact and the reality was that people were showing that they're, you know, still interested in engaging with me or even like, you know, today I had a friend that I didn't respond for a few days and she was like, oh, I was at work and it was really hectic. And I think before I might've been like, is it hectic or is she, does she really, like, I I almost thought that I knew what the real truth was beyond what people were saying. Like they may say that it was work, but it's actually because they, they don't really like me or like, you know, for an avoidant person, they may say that, you know, they love and value our friendship, but they're just saying that, like, it's like, you don't have any humility around your insecurities. You just think that they're the truth. And it gets, it gets to be like molasses to try to get out of. That makes so much sense. It's like quicksand. Yeah. Molasses is right. It's like, oh, you can't get out of it, but it's such a limiting way. And I've done that. Absolutely. Yes. I've done the same thing. Like, oh, why didn't they text me back? Or why didn't they call me back? Or why didn't I get invited to that? Part? Like what's going on? And we do immediately go to the assumed the worst case. Like, oh, exactly. They must be mad until again, he, when we really work with our attachment cells, it can just change, gosh, the whole way we see the world. Um, so talk about, you know, I, I'm thinking through my, my own life, like in school, I had fr- like, you know, grammar school, I had friends then, um, and then having children, dropping them off at preschool, you, you have to be in connection with other parents. Like you have to walk your kid into the school, drop them off in the classroom and walk back to your car. So of course I met all the moms because all the moms and some of the dads, of course, were dropping their kids off. And, um, so I made a lot of friends then. And then when my kids went to, then we moved to Nashville and my kids, um, we, I dropped them off again, um, at a private school and I met some of the parents, but then when they went to public school, they were on a bus and I realized I'm not meeting any of the parents. Like when they completely moved school dis, dis, district, so towns and everything. And I was like, hold on, <laughs> I'm not meeting any of these moms or dads anymore. It's, it was really hard. I found when I wasn't walking them into the classroom, it became harder to make friends. It's, and I thought, well, how in the world are you supposed to get out and make friends if you're not bringing your kids to school anymore? <laughs> and then moving back, now I moved back to Charlotte and I realized I have some of the friends that I had when I lived here, you know, 15 years ago, mm-hmm. but I, I'm like, well, I'm ready to make new friends. And I'm like, but my kids aren't living here anymore at all now. So how in the world? And I'm thinking like, as I've gone through life, I'm like, wow, it's just different. And I work full time, you know, and I have my family here. So I'm I'm pretty busy anyway. But when I do have some spare time, of course, I call the friends that I know. But in the back of my mind, I'm like, I kind of would like to make some new friends. So I got to figure out how to do that. So how do we do that? 
when yeah. we're, I can't even believe I'm going to say this word, older. Mm-hmm. <laughs> or let me just say it like this. When we aren't walking our kids into school, maybe someone listening, of course, a lot of people listening, they don't have kids. Or mm. again, their kids are out of the house, whatever it might be. How do you do that? Like, what are your suggestions yeah. around that? Well, I think it's great that it was coming more easy to you with your with your dropping kids off at school. And when I hear you that story, I think of the ingredients that Rebecca G. Adams, sociologist, considers necessary for friendship to happen more organically. Mm-hmm. And that is repeated unplanned interaction. So we see each other repeatedly, even though we're not necessarily intending to, uh, like school and shared vulnerability. So people start letting their guards down. And so if we have that infrastructure in our lives, friendship can happen more organically, but a lot of us don't have that infrastructure in our lives. Like, Mm -hmm. I think this is the problem with making friends in adulthood. People rely on, well, when I was a kid, I had school, it just happened, playground, it just happened. And if you're an adult and you don't have that anymore, you can't assume it's gonna happen organically. Like you're going to have to try. Um, well, and I, and I want, I want you to comment on this too. And then add, let's add post COVID to the mix post-COVID. where, oh my gosh, like I hardly ever leave my house. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. My mm-hmm. sister lives next door. My cousin's down this. It's like, everyone's close to me. So why leave the house? You know, yeah. they just come over to me. So what do we do post COVID when so many people are just working from home now? We're not in offices anymore. Right. Um, and yes, of course, we can go to yoga classes and things like that. But is that what we need to be doing more of? But even people are doing yeah. yoga at home on their apps, right? <laughs> right. You can work yeah. out from an, from your instructor that's on your phone FaceTiming you. True. So it just seems harder. So what do we do now? Right. It is hard. I mean, there's this concept, Arthur Brooks, he writes for The Atlantic, he calls it learned loneliness, that Mm. we've kind of adapted to just being a little lonely. And interestingly, 21% of people says, say that socializing is more important to them, but 35% of people says it's become less important and they're not putting themselves Mm. out as much. So, So I think just reminding ourselves if we've habituated to feeling kind of disconnected that we don't have to, and that if we make an effort, it can bring us a lot of benefits. Mm -hmm. Um, And so my advice is to, this is going to take a little bit of research, but find a community that's going to give you repeated unplanned interaction and shared vulnerability. So this could be a writing group. This could be a language class. This could be alumni group. This could be professional development for your job. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, like any sort of interests that you have pursuing it in community with other people And that capitalizes on something called the mere exposure effect, which is our tendency to like people when they become more familiar to us. So if you're just going to like one lecture, right, you know, you could take a adult learning class, but yeah, you're going to one lecture and you're hoping to meet someone. Mm -hmm. Then you, let's say you, you even ask someone to exchange contact information. They're way less likely to respond, be responsive than if you had seen them three times or four times. And then you ask, oh, can we change contact information? And then you reach out to them because again, merely being exposed to people increases our trust. And this is Mm -hmm. unconscious Mm -hmm. based off of research that finds that professors placing people into a psychology lecture for um, different amounts of classes throughout the semester, they found that at the end of the semester, none of the students remembered the women that were planted into their psychology lecture, but they liked the woman who showed up to the most classes Mm. 20% more than the one that didn't show up to any. So um, we need to capitalize on this, but, but not only that, right. Cause you talked about the yoga class. I go to yoga Mm -hmm. and often in yoga, nobody's really talking to each other. And so it's not just having that repeated interaction. That's going to form the connection. When you've gotten out of your house and you've, you know, found that community, you've overcome something called overt avoidance, which is our tendency to avoid people because we're nervous or scared, but you also have to overcome covert avoidance and covert avoidance is our tendency to show up physically, but check out mentally. Like at my yoga class, I'm just like doing my, my, um, Savasana. And so nobody's really approaching me with my eyes closed, you know, Um, or I'm coming at the last minute or I'm just on my phone. And then I kind of run out after like Mm -hmm. covert overcoming covert avoidance looks like saying like, Oh, how have you liked this class so far? You know, how are you enjoying it? How long have you been coming here? Hi, my name's Marissa. Uh, Actually introducing 
yourself to people and engaging with them. And I know this sounds scary. Some people are like, that's just too much for me. I'm too afraid of rejection. But I like to tell people, people are less likely to reject you than you think, according to the research. Um, when strangers interact, they then, and you ask them, how much do you think this other person likes them? We have this tendency to underestimate how liked we are. It's called the liking gap. And so you might be surprised by just how open people are to you when you're willing to put yourself out there. There's actually a study on this that's crazy. It's called the liking gap. The liking gap. Mm -hmm. so, so can you talk about that a little bit more? So we are, we assume, did you say we assume that people don't like us when we, when we meet them? We assume people like us less mm -hmm. than they actually do. So when they compared wow. people's ratings of how much they thought the person liked them, and then the person actually reported how much do I actually like this person, um, generally we underestimated how like we are. Dang. Interesting. We're so hard on ourselves as humans, aren't we? We are. We're so hard on ourselves. I really love this idea of assume that people like us. I really, really like that. Because if we can all hold that belief and just assume that wherever I'm going, people are going to like me, people are going to like me. I think that's, that really is a game changer. It's totally a game changer. It's, I mean, it's really changed my life. Like, at this point, initiating is pretty easy for me. Just being yeah. able to say, oh, hey, like, how are you enjoying this class? Or, you know, there's this, if you want to have a formal method to initiate with someone, there's yeah. this method called the insight and question method, which is you're just commenting on your shared setting and then asking a follow-up question. So women will do this like, I love your dress. Where did you get it? Uh, that's opening conversation. Or, oh, um, you know, like, oh, this is like the power yoga class. Have you taken this before? Or how have you liked this class before? Um, for example, or I don't know, someone sitting next to you in the coffee shop, like, oh, that looks really good. What drink is that? You know, and then just mm -hmm. taking it from there. I love that. Do you find that um, the more that we practice this, that it gets easier and more comfortable? Because I think that's what it is, isn't it? We're just uncomfortable. And we're again, exactly. assuming the worst. So yeah, it's uncomfortable and we don't want to talk to anybody. And it's funny, you're making me think of my cousin who, who will talk to, I talk to, I, I have no problem talking to people. My cousin talks like a hundred times more than me. Like she talked to the fly in the wall, but wherever we go, the joke is, you know, my cousin will talk to everybody in line at Target in front of her, behind her, next to her. And she makes friends like crazy, absolutely mm. like crazy. But I would think, I'm glad to hear it does get easier over time. And to ask, I remember uh, my father taught me this many years ago when I was 16 years old. He said, ask people questions. People love to talk about themselves versus, and I think that's a great way for someone listening. I'm trying to give people some ideas. So if you're listening to this, how do you start a conversation? You ask someone else a question, like you were saying, what drink are you drinking? If you're at Starbucks or a coffee shop, how did you like the class today? That was really hard. Or comment on the class and what did you think anything else you want to add to that like these conversation starters because it can be hard and like we are yeah. out of practice I'm just saying we are really out of practice we really are I would say it's not so much about what you say it's more about the fact that you are opening up conversation mm. um because there, the theory of inferred attraction is basically the idea that people like people that they think like them. And when you're initiating conversation with someone, you're conveying interest in them, liking in them, mm -hmm. which is flattering. And so the fact that you're saying something to them and making them out to be someone who, you know, is special to you in some way and not, not mm -hmm. like special to you, like you're in love with them, but just like they stand out to you and makes the larger crowd, right? Yeah. That conveys interest in them. So even if you say like, Hi, I'm Marissa. How's your day going? Right? Like sometimes I'll do this and there's a moment where people freeze because they're just kind of like, what's going on? Like yeah. people don't really talk to each other here. And I think our problem is sometimes we might take that freezing moment as a rejection moment when it's actually like a, I'm trying to understand this situation. Mm -hmm. um, but if you get past the freeze, then they're like, hey, yeah, like, this is what I think about this class or yeah, hi, nice to meet you, Marissa. Like I did a speaking engagement at a church and, um, you know, I come in and I say to everyone, like, 
hello, like my name is Marissa. It's so good to meet you. And I do not look like anyone at this church. It's predominantly white church. You know, I'm lighter skinned, biracial black person. And so they're just kind of staring at me and I'm just like, okay, this is a little awkward. Um, but then later on when we had small groups and I was able to talk to them more, they were like, you're so warm and you oh. came in so inviting and just said hi to us and engage with us. And I was like, oh, cause it would be easy for me to interpret that moment as a moment of rejection, but it was actually a moment of calibration, I think, for them to kind of wrap their heads around, yeah. around um, the fact that I was initiating with them. That's interesting because, and I'm thinking, cause you're, where do you live? In DC, you're, Washington. You're DC. in DC. Yeah. So I'm from Rochester up near Buffalo and Syracuse, right? That's where I was born and raised. And then um, I now live in Charlotte in, in North Carolina and I lived in Nashville, Tennessee. So up North, no offense, because I love Northerners. I love how direct everybody is. I miss that. I have to tell you, there are a lot of Nor Northerners down in Charlotte, I have to say, but um, it's different. Like I remember going up there and visiting friends after I moved down here. And when you live down here and even in Nashville, it's very friendly. Like you walk on the, you walk in the park on a trail, everybody, just about 99% of the people are like, Hey, how are you? Hey, how are you? <laughs> So That's I go so nice. up to, to Rochester and I'm hanging out with my friend. I can still see this. And we're walking down the path and I'm saying hello to everybody. <laughs> Hardly anyone saying hello to me. Like, and my friend said to me, why are you saying hello to everybody? And I'm like, what do you mean? Like, why wouldn't I ever walking by somebody? She goes, that's so weird. And I thought, isn't that interesting? Isn't that so interesting? It is I'm in a different part of the country. And again, I have no judgment because I love it up there. I miss how direct it is up there, but not as maybe as open or something, but I think I still have to say though, asking someone a question, not maybe on a path, like, like I was doing, but um, <laughs> like if you're in a yoga class or you're in a meditation class or you're in a drawing class or a dance class or a type, whatever the heck you're in and asking someone, Hey, how did you like the class? Wasn't that so good? Or wasn't that hard when we did da da da? Mm -hmm. I still say that people will talk to us. I still think that that's true. Absolutely. And you know what? I really think if you want to make friends, it is so important to get rejected. Like, I really just think it's just so important to get rejected because first of all, you're a lot less likely to be rejected than you think. But second of all, if you are rejected, you can still value and appreciate yourself for putting yourself out there because yeah. the outcome, you can't judge yourself by the outcome. You can only judge yourself by your own actions, right? So just because right. someone wasn't responsive to you, it's not something you're in control of. You still succeeded by putting yourself out there. But the second thing is like the people that are willing to get rejected are the people that end up having the most curated social circles of people that they truly mm. love and feel close to, where the people that aren't willing to get rejected often lonelier and even the friends that they do have are not friends that they chose for themselves and so I think obviously rejection is painful for all of us and you know if there's too much of it and we don't give ourselves breathing room it can be overwhelming but rejection is just part of the process of connection rejection is yeah. the consolation prize for finding the community that you really really want and so I think it's something to be really proud of, of ourselves like even when we're getting rejected. And the problem that I see is like, sometimes I'll hear people say, you know, I wanted to make friends. And four years ago, I texted someone and then they kind of ghosted on me. And I've just realized I'm not good at it. And I'm just like, no, that was what <laughs> one the friend. problem. Yeah. yeah is that yeah. we just generalize that this is how one person reacted to us. So this is how everyone will re react to us. But no, like that rejection was part of your journey toward connection. And so it's not a sign to stop. It's a sign that you're part, you're, you're in part of the trajectory. And so it's a sign that you should continue and continue to do what you're doing. I think we need to remind ourselves too, that if someone doesn't like us, it might have nothing to do with us. Like we, we, we take it personally, you know, and who knows why that they don't want to connect with us, but we can't make it about ourselves. Exactly. And I have one word for that. So if someone's reaching out and I agree with you, like if you get a rejection, there's one word I have, if you get rejected and that word is next, it's like, keep going. <laughs> Who's That's next? Great. I'm going to do That's it again. Great. I want to re I want to attach again. I'm going to reach out again. And I think you're right. Like the more that we do reach out. Um, and I have to say, like I moved when I moved back here in 20, the end of 2020, there were some people that I hadn't heard from. And I lived here 
for 10 years prior to Nashville. So I was here for 10 years, moved to Nashville for 13, and then came back here. And I was like, well, all these people know that I'm here. Why is it, you know, there are a few people that still haven't reached out. And I thought, well, and I went into that, like, well, my, my, of course, my ego started kicking in, like, well, maybe they just don't like you. Maybe they're mad at you. I'm like, this is the craziest thing. They haven't seen me in years. Why would they be mad at me? That's crazy. <laughs> so we have to talk back to that part. And, and we mm-hmm. listen to those parts. And I said, all right, hold on. Let me re- just reach out. And every single person I reached out to, they were like, yay, we knew you were settling in. And we just wanted to wait till you, you know, until you reach out. Everyone I reached out to, they're like, absolutely. Let's go out to dinner. Let's mm. get, you know, that'd be great. Let's go for a walk, whatever it was. So it mm. really does work. And um, yeah, and I think we have to stop taking things so personally and just keep exactly. going. If you get rejected once, who the heck Next. cares? Keep going. Next. And Next. That's, I think you also have a really good point in that story, which is the idea that sometimes what we might perceive as rejection, the other person might perceive as an act of love, right? Like Mm -hmm. I'm not bothering you because you're settling in and I want to give you time and space or you just had a kid. So I didn't want to bother you. I know you're really busy or, you know, some people who they just wait for their friends to reach out for them to them. And they don't reach out because it's, they're like, well, I assume that if you don't reach out to me, you don't want to hear from me. And I want to be respectful of that. And even my students now, like I teach Gen Z, and I had no idea they could perceive things like this, but when they're in a conversation <laughs> and there's a lull, they'll take out their phone. And some of them has said, it's a way of indicating to the person. It's not that you're boring me. It's that there's something important on my phone. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. So some of them perceive it as an act of graciousness to take out their phone, which is so wild to me. So I think there's so many ways that sometimes what we think is a rejection, the other person is actually thinking of as um, consideration. Oh, wow. That's the thing. And, you know, I can't remember. I read a, a, st- a statistic so many years ago, probably almost 20 years ago, and it said, that the assumption, the stories and assumptions that we make up in our minds are typically 97% of the time false. 97%. That's so high. I wish I could find that who said that because I I still quote, I don't even know who it was. I remember reading it a long time ago, but it stuck with me clear, clearly because it's maybe 20 years old. Um, but that's how wrong I think our ego can be, you know, exactly. I was thinking just even a few months ago, a friend of mine was going through a hard time and I was reaching out to her. I was just texting her. Like, I'm just letting you know I'm here. I'd give her a call. She wouldn't answer. Called, no answer. Texted, no answer again, right? Mm -hmm. And then I found myself after not getting any response, I was like, well, it's okay. She's having a hard time. And then after a couple of days, I was like, wait a minute. Like my anxious attachment started kicking in big time. I was like, wait, where are you? Like, hold on. Like, why aren't you reaching out to me? And it was like, days, like a week had gone by. Mm-hmm. I was like, okay, I've called twice, I've texted twice. Finally, I got a hold of her. I just called her one day again. She picked up and she's like, hey, and I was like, what's going on? You know, I'm reaching out. Did I do something wrong? Are you upset with me? She goes, no, what are you talking about? I said, <laughs> well, you're not getting back to me. And she said, I am in the worst place. I feel horrible. I feel, I don't want to. And she said, I don't want to lay my burdens on you. Mm-hmm. And I know if I call you back, I'm going to be crying. I just, I'm going through a hard time. I'm like, Oh my gosh, you know, let me know. And, but I had gone into this horrible story after like a few days, Mm -hmm. which, you know, but when we find the truth, it's just not, it's not about us again. This is what I mean. Like oftentimes it's not about us. It's about something that other person is going through. Even if you meet someone for the first time Mm -hmm. and you try to talk to them and they're jerks to you and they're just not nice to your face. How do you know that they're not going through something horrible in their personal Mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. And if they weren't going through that, they might've talked to you after yoga or whatever class you're taking. So keep, keep going for it. Who cares if you get rejected, go for it and just use the word next and find your next Next. friend and build those friend circles. Yeah. I love it. Anything else you want to share? This was good stuff. I think we did a lot. We covered a lot of cool stuff. <laughs> I think we did, right? This was really yeah. good. Where might people find you? Um, so you can read my New York Times bestselling book, Platonic, How the Science of Attachment Can Help You Make and Keep Friends. Uh, if you want more on the science of connection, I have an Instagram at 
Dr. Marissa G. Franco. That's D-R-M-A-R-I-S-A-G-F-R-A-N-C-O. And on my website, drmarissagfranco.com, you can reach out for speaking engagements or take my quiz, which will assess your strengths and weaknesses as a friend and give you some suggestions. Very nice. All right. We'll put all that in the show notes, of course. And thank you so much. You're welcome. This is a great conversation. Thanks for being my new friend. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I appreciate you being How on How you today. do it. <laughs> yeah, this was good. Thank you. You're welcome.